On a spring morning in 2009, a man in the city of Wausau, Wisconsin was on his way to work when he noticed something in the parking lot of a local apartment complex. Actually, it's probably more accurate to say that he noticed the absence of something, an item that he expected to be there, but that was currently nowhere to be found. Now, after noticing this, the man would make a disturbing decision, one that was built entirely on an assumption about what he had just seen. This assumption would not only turn out to be completely wrong, but it would cause things to spiral out of control so horrifically that by the time it was all over, it had resulted in an awful tragedy. Mississippi County 911, what is your emergency? I have a neighbor over here. He Where? speaks Spanish. I don't. South 12th Ave. He said um, someone needs an ambulance over there. What's going on with him? said that um, his brother's girlfriend is lying on the floor and they think she's dead. What is your name, sir? My name is Hugo. Tell him to stay with you. Are you okay here? Yes. My, my, my brother's girlfriend. Okay, come on, just come down. They'll be here as fast as we can. The 911 call you just heard was placed on May 2nd, 2009, just before 1.30 p.m. It was made by a female resident at an apartment complex on South 12th Avenue Court in Wausau, Wisconsin, who explained that she had just been approached by a frantic neighbor. The man, 19-year-old Hugo Ramirez, claimed that he had just stumbled across something terrible in the upstairs unit where he lived. He could barely form sentences because of how much he was crying and shaking, but he said he thought it was the body of his brother's girlfriend. When Wausau police arrived at the scene, they were met by Hugo, who was still extremely emotional. They were about to understand why. What was waiting for them in there was nothing short of horrifying. Upon entering the apartment, investigators were led through the common living room and kitchen areas and into a short hallway. Hugo motioned towards a bedroom at the very end on the left-hand side. Before even making it through the doorway, detectives were struck by the brutality of the scene. There was blood all over the carpet, the room, and many of the items inside, some of which had already started to dry. Lying on the floor was the body of a young woman. Hugo said her name was Brianna Schneller. She was 18 years old and lived with him and his 22-year-old brother, Sebastian. Brianna and Sebastian were in a relationship and were engaged to be married. Brianna was lying on her back, her face covered with towels. She had clearly been the victim of a vicious attack one that had left her with stab wounds and lacerations to a large portion of her head, neck, and upper torso. Additional injuries on her hands indicated that she had fought for her life. While forensic techs continued to scour the crime scene for clues, detectives asked Hugo to come down to the station with them for further questioning. They likewise wanted to speak with his brother Sebastian, who by now had also been informed about the awful situation. He wasn't the only one either. Within just a couple of hours of the disturbing discovery, news crews had flooded the apartment complex and word was quickly spreading that something terrible had happened there. That made it all the more important for police to tackle their next priority as quickly as possible, reaching out to Brianna's loved ones. By the time officers contacted the Schneller family, they were aware that something had taken place at Brianna's apartment building and that someone was dead. What they didn't know was that Brianna was the victim. Tragically, they had been calling, desperately trying to get a hold of her to no avail. Once down at the station, they were given the heartbreaking news. Even after positively identifying her through photos taken at the scene, Brianna's father Craig, her mother Lori, and her brother Rocky were understandably still in disbelief. They struggled to process how something like this could have happened, especially to someone like Brianna. Despite their unimaginable grief, the family members did what they could to provide as much information possible to police. Most of this consisted of details about Brianna and her life in the lead up to her murder. The family explained that for the most part, Brianna's life was like any other teens her age. She went to school, had a part-time job, and enjoyed hanging out with friends in her free time. Brianna was a senior at DC Everest High School in the neighboring city of Schofield, where tragically, 
she was supposed to graduate in a few weeks' time. She worked at a local restaurant called El Mezcal, where she was well-liked by co-workers and regular customers. She enjoyed shopping, dancing, and listening to music. As far as the family was concerned, none of this made sense. As Craig put it, she didn't have an enemy in the world. When asked about her relationship with Sebastian, Brianna's parents said that it was a good one. The pair had met a couple of years earlier and had instantly become inseparable. And in that time, they had gotten to know Sebastian quite well. Of course, they had their reservations when Brianna decided to move in with him after turning 18, especially because of how young they both were. However, they were both legally adults, had gotten engaged, and it was obvious that they wanted to be together. The parents said it was also clear that Sebastian really loved their daughter. The last person in the family to hear from Brianna was Lori, who had spoken to her just a few hours before her body had been discovered. They talked briefly and exchanged texts because Lori had taken Brianna's car in to have the brakes fixed that day. She said that was just after 10 a.m. This helped detectives to narrow the timeline. The crime had happened sometime in the three and a half hour window between when the mother and daughter had last spoken and when the 911 call came in just before 1.30 p.m. While this conversation was taking place, Back at the crime scene, other members of the investigative team had successfully started to uncover a number of additional unsettling clues. They started with an electric iron, which looked like it might have been used in the killing. It was found on the floor not far from Brianna's body. Pieces had broken off and were scattered on the carpet, and there was a small amount of blood on it. The next major area of interest for investigators was the bathroom. Disturbingly, Two knives had been left in the sink, one of which was missing the tip of its blade. The knives were determined to have come from the apartment's kitchen and were believed to be the murder weapons. It looked like whoever was responsible had gone to the trouble of trying to clean them, though had failed to realize they left a bloody shoe imprint on the bath mat. To police, it suggested that Brianna's killer may have been in a hurry. A search of the rest of the residence revealed two final noteworthy observations. First, there were no signs of forced entry. Second, there didn't appear to be anything missing. This latter clue was particularly significant because detectives had found cash scattered in various places in Hugo's room. The money was pretty much all small bills, though there seemed to be a good amount of it there. This was interesting because it suggested that robbery probably wasn't the primary motive. In fact, the more that investigators looked at the evidence, the more that they started to feel like there was one direction everything was pointing. Nothing stolen, a seeming familiarity with the crime scene, and an over-the-top brutal killing. It was beginning to look like this was a crime of passion. But if Brianna Schneller had been targeted, what was the reason? Authorities weren't sure, but they knew there were two people that they needed to speak with next. After analyzing the brutal crime scene and speaking with the Schneller family, detectives with the Wausau Police Department turned their attention to Brianna's two roommates, Sebastian and Hugo Ramirez. In the minds of investigators, the brothers were the two most obvious suspects for a number of reasons, not least of which being their familiarity with the 18-year-old victim and the fact that the murder had taken place inside their apartment. As previously mentioned, the pair were brought down to the station for questioning, at which point they were taken into separate interview rooms so that their stories could be compared. Sebastian's version of events was fairly straightforward. He said that he had woken up at around 9.15 that morning, about an hour before he was supposed to show up at the Mexican restaurant where he and his brother worked. The restaurant, El Tequila Salsa, was under two miles away from the apartment. It was only about a five to 10 minute drive depending on what route you took. Sebastian said he took a shower and hung out with Brianna for a bit since it was Saturday and she didn't have school. Hugo slept in, so he woke him up before heading out just after 10. He said he arrived at work just before 10.15, and that's where he had been right up until he got the call informing him that something terrible had happened. Hugo's story started off very similar to Sebastian's. He said that when his brother woke him up, he quickly got ready for work leaving the house about 10 to 15 minutes after him. 
The differences started when he left the restaurant early that afternoon. How much longer after Sebastian was it that you left? Maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And how late did you work? And this is 1.20. And then what did you do? I had my car and go out to my house. Hugo explained that when his break came up shortly before 1.30 p.m., he decided to go home to take a quick nap. When he got to the apartment, at first everything seemed normal. He walked in and headed down the hall as he normally would without really stopping to look around. It wasn't until he actually got into his bedroom that he started to get an uneasy feeling. And that's when he noticed that Sebastian's door was open. He got up and to his horror realized that Brianna was lying on the floor. After running to the door, Hugo started screaming Brianna's name, pleading with her to answer him and to get up. But no response ever came. And by this time, Hugo was starting to take in just how much blood was in the room. The 19-year-old told detectives that he had tried to call 911, but it was like his brain was short-circuiting. His mind went blank, his hands were trembling too much to even press the buttons, and he ended up running downstairs where he tried to hysterically explain to a neighbor that they needed to call for help. Though Hugo and Sebastian both seemed genuinely quite emotional about what had happened during their interviews, investigators knew that this didn't necessarily mean that they weren't involved. Perhaps this was remorse masquerading as shock and sadness, or maybe the whole thing was a very convincing act. Since both brothers' stories matched up, they considered the possibility that one might be covering for the other. They reasoned that if this were the case, it was likely Sebastian who had the motive to kill. They asked both brothers about the nature of their relationship with Brianna and if there were any problems between them before her death. Sebastian categorically denied any involvement in Brianna's murder and stuck to his story. He said that she was the love of his life and that the two of them had been excited about their future together. Detectives grilled Hugo even harder, asking him if there was any tension he knew about in his brother's relationship. Did he think Sebastian was capable of something like this? They also wanted to know. Was there anything going on between him and Brianna? Just like his brother, Hugo said absolutely not. Brianna was like a sister to him, and she and Sebastian were in love. Do you think your brother had anything to do with that? He was gone before me. Now, and I don't mean to try to stir anything up here, but, I mean, did you have any strong feelings for her at all? Had you ever had a relationship with her? No, sir. Okay. No, okay. Had, had she ever sought a relationship with you? No. Look at her like a sister. She look at me like a brother. These conversations continued for hours, but no matter what detectives asked, Hugo and Sebastian maintained their stories. That being said, they were able to provide information that cleared up at least one of the mysteries at the crime scene. What was with all that loose cash? Hugo explained that it was his tip money from the restaurant. He said he used to try and throw it all in a dish in his room, but recently he had gotten pretty lazy with it. Most days when he got home, he just emptied his pockets wherever and then just dealt with the money later. Before finishing their interviews, both Ramirez brothers agreed to provide DNA samples for comparison purposes with evidence at the crime scene, which by now had been sent off for testing. Despite being released after questioning, authorities still considered Hugo and Sebastian to be the only real persons of interest that they had in the case so far. As a result, their next stop was the Mexican restaurant where they both worked to see if they could verify their alibis. Luckily for police, El Tequila Salsa had surveillance cameras installed in various places inside the business, including the kitchen. When they reviewed the footage, it appeared to back up what the brothers had told them. Sebastian had arrived first that morning at 10.13, after which he hadn't left until Brianna's body had been discovered. Hugo had come in a few minutes later, leaving for his break at around 1.20 p.m., just like he had said. It seemed that Hugo and Sebastian were telling their truth about their movements. Co-workers likewise stated that they had seen the brothers working during the hours that they had described. After receiving word that Brianna's autopsy had been completed, detectives traveled to the medical examiner's office, hoping that the results might offer additional clues. Unfortunately, most of what they were told simply emphasized what they already knew. 
this had been an absolutely heinous attack. According to the ME, Brianna had suffered at least 20 stab wounds, as well as blunt force trauma to her head. The stabbing injuries were particularly vicious, with at least two of them capable of killing her in under a minute. Disturbingly, the tip of the broken knife that had been found in the bathroom sink was recovered from one of these wounds. Detectives theorized that the blunt force injuries had come from the iron found on the floor near Brianna's body. All of this seemed to further support the idea that the killing had been personal in nature. Though the autopsy didn't reveal as much as investigators had hoped, there was still the possibility that further testing might hold some answers. Because of the defensive wounds on Brianna's hands, there was a chance that she had gotten a hold of her killer at some point during the struggle. If so, this might have left behind DNA, particularly under her fingernails. Swabs were taken and were sent off for analysis alongside all of the other evidence that had previously been collected from the crime scene. Around this same time, detectives received an update about another potential lead. It would prove to be the most important piece of information they had yet encountered. You see, shortly before this, authorities had discovered that there actually was one item missing from the apartment. It was Brianna's cell phone. Family members said that she always had it with her and that it was extremely unusual that police hadn't found it at the crime scene. This was especially true because if you'll remember, Brianna had exchanged messages with her mom that morning. This meant that she definitely had the phone with her prior to her death. It also meant that there very well could be something on Brianna's phone that might hold the key to understanding her murder. Understandably, after learning this, Wausau police had made finding the 18-year-old cell phone a top priority. They reached out to her service provider, who sent a ping to the device, which luckily was still turned on. Using this data, they were able to provide detectives with pretty accurate information about where the phone was located. Investigators took one look at these details and were stunned. They realized that this was not only a place that they recognized, it was one that they had already been to. The cell phone was pinging right near El Tequila Salsa, the restaurant where Hugo and Sebastian Ramirez both worked. After receiving the critical information about Brianna Schneller's cell phone from her service provider, Detectives raced over to El Tequila Salsa to try and recover the device as quickly as possible. Upon arriving at the scene, they determined that the coordinates they were provided were not actually for the restaurant itself, but somewhere in the parking lot of the plaza where the business was located. Police soon narrowed in on a specific area of interest, a back corner of the lot where there were a number of dumpsters. Detectives opened these one by one, calling Brianna's phone as they did so. Eventually, they heard something that sounded like a ringtone coming from inside one of the dumpsters. They moved the contents of the bin until they saw a bag tucked down near the bottom. Through its white plastic material, they could see what was unmistakably the light from a phone screen. After pulling the bag from the dumpster, detectives could tell that there was more than just Brianna's phone inside. Before they could open it, though, the bag needed to be sent off for testing in case there was any other DNA or useful evidence on the outside, particularly at the top where it had been tied shut. That being said, there was no mistaking it. The plastic bag was an exact match to ones that investigators had seen being used for takeout orders inside of El Tequila Salsa. Needless to say, this development did not look good for Hugo and Sebastian Ramirez who detectives had already been suspicious of to begin with. Of course, there was still the question of the brother's alibi, which had appeared to check out. Though the more investigators considered this, the more they thought they might have an explanation. You see, while the video footage proved that Sebastian and Hugo had been at work from about 10.15 a.m. onwards on May 2nd, authorities had only an approximate idea of when Brianna had actually been killed. If you recall, the blood at the crime scene had already dried in places by the time police were called. So they knew the crime had probably happened at least a couple of hours earlier. At this point, detectives started to wonder, was it possible that either Hugo or Sebastian had committed the murder before they went to work? 
Investigators pin their hopes on the newly discovered plastic takeout bag, which once processed for evidence they believed would help them to find the answers they were looking for. In the meantime, they took a second look at the surveillance footage from El Tequila Salsa. Unfortunately, the restaurant itself didn't have any exterior cameras, so authorities got to work obtaining additional footage from other businesses nearby. The goal was to use this footage to try and figure out who had actually put the bag in the dumpster. This tactic worked. Well, sort of. It turned out that the only camera that really had a clear shot of the dumpster area was from a gas station in the next parking lot over. This wasn't the greatest quality camera to begin with, and the distance made it even harder to make out what was going on. Unfortunately, the vast majority of this footage was never released, but we do have a small snippet of it so we can kind of give you an idea of what investigators were working with. See that barely visible blurry figure near the top right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a person. Even with these obvious limitations, the footage was useful to detectives. At the very least, they were able to see people coming and going from the dumpster area and catalog those times, even if they weren't 100% sure who these people were. In fact, this would ultimately prove to be very useful. Though, we're not there just yet. First, let's get back to what I'm sure many of you have been waiting for. What was in the plastic takeout bag? Well, as previously mentioned, the bag contained Brianna Schneller's cell phone, which, luckily for investigators, was still in complete working order. The other items inside were quite a bit more random. There were two mismatched winter gloves, at least one of which had traces of blood on it, as well as two pairs of women's underwear. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this collection of items posed more questions than answers for detectives. This was particularly true of the underwear, which were found to belong to Brianna, but didn't seem to fit at all with the direction the case was pointing so far. If Hugo or Sebastian were involved, why would they have taken them? As authorities looked through Brianna's phone, things got even stranger when they discovered that the last activity on the device was later than they initially thought. It was during the point at which they knew the Ramirez brothers were already at work. Just like that, the whole investigation had done a 180. Within minutes, Hugo and Sebastian had gone from looking incredibly guilty to completely innocent. If that were the case, though, who was responsible for the awful crime? Luckily, police were about to make another important discovery. On May 7, 2009, so, five days after Brianna Schneller's murder, a vigil was held for her at her high school. It was attended by hundreds of her friends, family members, classmates, teachers, and those from the broader community, all of whom came out to celebrate her life and her tragic loss. Photos and posters of the 18-year-old were put up everywhere, with so many people signing and leaving final messages for Brianna that at more than one point, organizers had to go back into the school to find more. As one newspaper report eerily put it at the time, quote, The posters could have just as easily been propped up at a graduation party. Instead, they served as a chilling reminder of a life cut short. Indeed, though Brianna had only gotten to experience 18 short years, the turnout at her vigil and her funeral the following day made it clear just how many lives she had touched and how loved she was. It also hammered home just how much more life she had left to live. At the time of her death, Brianna had been excited about the future. She had an upcoming trip that summer to Tennessee, where she was supposed to present a nationally recognized project that she did for the student organization Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. She was looking forward to attending college, where she wanted to get an education in restaurant management. When she was finished, she dreamed of one day opening a restaurant with her fiancé, Sebastian. Speaking of Sebastian, he and Hugo appeared alongside the Schneller family, imploring the public for any information that they might have about the case. Craig, Lori, and the rest of Brianna's family thanked the community for their overwhelming support. But it was clear to everyone that the lack of answers had a real impact on both events. It was hard to properly grieve 
when there was no closure. As it happened, detectives were finally about to get the break that everyone had been waiting for. On May 9th, Wausau police finally finished combing through all of the surveillance video taken from both the parking lot of El Tequila Salsa, as well as the restaurant itself. Now, as I mentioned earlier, separately, neither of these pieces of footage were able to identify the person who had put the plastic takeout bag in the dumpster. However, when authorities cross-referenced these videos, they were able to come up with a much more complete picture of what had happened. It all pointed to one person, a 22-year-old cook at the restaurant named Raul Ponce Rocha. The whole thing started when police began paying attention to the back door of the restaurant in the kitchen surveillance footage and comparing this to the gas station video that showed the dumpster area. It revealed that Raul had gone out to the dumpster where the plastic bag was later discovered at 1.16 p.m. that afternoon. Corresponding video showed him coming back into the kitchen right afterwards and washing his hands. A far more interesting bit of video, though, showed that Raul had been the only person to leave the restaurant during the window of time in which the crime had taken place. He was seen walking out the back door at 10.21 a.m. that morning, just a few minutes after both Sebastian and Hugo arrived at work. He didn't get back until 10.56 a.m. Interestingly, he was wearing a brown hooded sweatshirt when he left, which was notably absent when he returned. Investigators wanted to know, what had the 22-year-old been doing for 35 minutes at the exact time that Brianna Schneller was being murdered? When detectives sat down with Raul for an interview, he told them that he left the restaurant that morning because he had to pick up another employee, a dishwasher named Luciano. When asked where Luciano's house was, Raul gave a startling reply. The same apartment complex where Hugo Ramirez lived. Did you ever leave the restaurant then? I did. In the morning. What time in the morning? Like around 10, 20. I went to the apartment to pick up Luciano. Who was that? He was oh, this was. He was this one. I know that. Which apartment? The, where Payugo is. Oh, that same? Yeah. He lives there. Luciano lives there. How long does it take you to drive to those apartments? More like 10 minutes. 10 minutes back to the restaurant? Yeah. What happened the rest of that day? Well, then, well, we start working. Mm -hmm. When asked about how the pickup went that day, Raul replied that everything was fine. He said he honked his horn for Luciano after arriving and only had to wait a couple of minutes before he came out. He further verified that the two of them hadn't made any stops on their way back to work. Hearing this, detectives immediately confronted Raul about the discrepancies in his timeline. Based on what he was claiming, the trip to pick up Luciano only should have taken 20 minutes at the absolute most. There was at least a full 15 minutes unaccounted for. 15 minutes, which investigators quickly learned Raul could not, or rather would not, explain. When asked about the cuts on his hands, Raul had a slightly more plausible story. He was a cook, after all, and he worked with knives all day long. That being said, at least one of his injuries looked to detectives like it had happened pretty recently. You had some cuts on your hands, small ones. Can you explain what those cuts were from? This one for a sharpening, or how you call the knife. Sharpening the knife? Uh-huh. Uh, do you remember what day that was? No, at this like three weeks ago. Long time ago? Did that one just does not want to heal up? Or? I know, like this one, but that was bad. Though investigators were now sure that they had the right person, there were still a couple of gaps left to explain. The biggest of all being, why had Raul killed Brianna? Fortunately, Wausau police already had enough evidence to obtain a DNA sample from him, as well as to get a warrant to search the house where he lived with his parents. After discovering that the 22-year-old was in the United States illegally as an undocumented immigrant, he was also placed in custody while the investigation continued. When told of Raul's arrest, those that he worked with couldn't believe it. Hugo was especially caught off guard. He had always been friendly to him, and as far as he knew, had only maybe met Brianna a couple of times in passing. However, the case against Raul only grew more damning when police searched his bedroom at his parents' house. 
There, they found a glove that was a perfect match to one of the ones found in the takeout bag, as well as the brown sweater he was wearing in the restaurant surveillance video. On it, detectives found a hair that looked like it could belong to Brianna Schneller. The last discovery in Raoul's room finally shed light on the potential motive behind the case. Under his mattress, police found several adult videos, as well as four more pairs of women's underwear. Investigators were able to piece everything together when they remembered one other detail from early on in the case. That statement from Brianna's mother, Lori, where she said that she had brought her daughter's car in on May 2nd to have the brakes fixed. It turned out that on the morning of the murder, Raul had started work at around 9 a.m. On his way there, he had driven past the South 12th Avenue Court apartment complex, where he noticed that Brianna's car wasn't in its usual spot. Assuming this meant that she wasn't there, and knowing that Hugo and Sebastian would soon be leaving the house as well, he decided that this would be a perfect opportunity to steal some of Brianna's underwear for his collection. Minutes after Hugo and Sebastian walked through the door, Raoul seized his opportunity, driving back to the apartment complex under the guise of picking up Luciano. When he got there, he took a detour, instead making his way into Brianna, Hugo, and Sebastian's place. The problem was, Raoul had been wrong about his assumption. Brianna was home, and she caught him in the act. Knowing that she was definitely going to be able to identify him, he panicked, first hitting her with the iron and then viciously attacking her with two kitchen knives. After the murder, he hastily tried to clean up, taking some of the evidence with him because he still had to pick up Luciano. He then went back to work as if nothing had happened, throwing out the evidence in an attempt to cover up the crime. If there was any remaining doubt about Raoul's guilt, this was put to rest when detectives finally got back all of the evidence they had sent away for testing. The knife, the plastic bag, the gloves, the iron, Brianna's fingernails, the 22-year-old's DNA was on all of it. The hair found on Raoul's brown hoodie was also found to belong to Brianna, and even the bloody shoe print in the bathroom was found to be a match to the size and tread of a pair he had been wearing on the day of the crime. He was charged with Brianna Schneller's murder. Even with the overwhelming evidence against him, Raul Ponce Rocha denied everything, seemingly unfazed by the fact that Hugo and Sebastian had already nearly been blamed for his crime. He would also go on to attempt to pin the murder on another innocent man. Though Raul had previously said that he never came into contact with Brianna during his initial interviews with police, by the time his trial started in early 2011, his story had drastically changed. Now he claimed that he had been in the apartment that day, and that when he left, another one of their co-workers, Sergio, had stayed behind. Despite what a bald-faced lie this was, for a moment, it apparently had the potential to derail the prosecution's case. You see, Sergio had left the United States and gone back to Mexico shortly after the murder, and Raul's defense team were clearly going to use this to sow reasonable doubt about his guilt. Fortunately, authorities were able to get in contact with Sergio in Mexico, who was understandably not happy to hear that his name was being dragged through the mud. He came back to the United States to testify, providing proof that showed he had been nowhere near the crime scene on the day of the murder, and that he had gone back to Mexico to take care of his sick father, who had been diagnosed with cancer. With this, all of the evidence and emotional testimony from both Hugo and Sebastian, Raoul's defense crumbled. When it was all over, it took the jury just 90 minutes to convict him of first-degree intentional homicide, burglary, and theft. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and at the time of this recording, remains incarcerated at the Wapon Correctional Institution. This is one of those cases where there's so much tragedy and hurt to go around that it's hard to know where to begin. I hate to sound cliche because I really do mean it, but Brianna Schneller was so young and had so much life ahead of her. She was happy, loved, and was clearly on her way to achieving her dreams before her future was so callously stolen from her. 
the thing that hit me the hardest while doing the research for this story was hearing the statements and testimony from Brianna's family. It's clear that this tragedy just broke so many of them, especially her father, Craig. In interviews we came across, he discussed struggling with alcohol and depression after Brianna's death, and for a time, losing faith in God. Though this is obviously really heartbreaking stuff to hear, I have to commend Craig for his courage, because it seems he's been remarkably open and honest about his experience with grief over the years. It's something that I don't know that I could do in his situation, and I think it provides really valuable insight for those of us that, quite frankly, just don't understand what it's like to go through something like this. I'll leave a link to a really good article we came across in the description below where he talks about a lot of what he went through and his ongoing journey, not just to get past the things he blames himself for, but to try and forgive the person actually responsible for Brianna's murder. In the article, which is from 2019, he says that one day he wants to sit down with Raul one-on-one -on -one and speak to him about everything that happened. It's unclear if that meeting has yet taken place, though the article did suggest Raul was the one delaying it, if anything. It seems that he still has yet to take responsibility for his actions. As for Hugo and Sebastian, not a lot of information is available about them. Hugo participated in a couple of crime TV shows covering the case, where it's obvious the whole ordeal still affects him quite a lot to this day. The only thing we were able to find out about Sebastian was that he had moved to Indiana by the time of Raoul's trial to be closer to his family. Everything we came across in our research, though, suggested that he really loved Brianna and that she was his best friend. One thing is for sure. The impact of this awful crime will never truly go away. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you'd consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.